Welcome, everybody. Good to have you here. And one of the other things we'd like to cover is that if you have a phone, this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity. Jason. Maybe a little bit left. Thank you. Anyway, this is your opportunity to put it on stun or even turn it off. But we'd really like to have nothing coming from here as far as noise like that. We've got a lot of stuff going on here. And it looks like everybody's got the actual video. Did you, you have the right right name? Okay, good. You know, you want to be done with it. But, uh, so since I'm still, you're still done with it. Okay, since I'm talking to you, why don't you lead off and tell everybody who you are, what you do. John, I'd like to introduce me. He's a great man. Vito Barbieri, District 2. State Affairs, Business, and Local Government, all of them. Pretty busy. Hi, Don Cheatham, Senate, District 3. And my committees are Judiciary, Rules and Administration, and Local Government Taxation. And thank you for being here. I am Representative Ron Mendai, representing District 3 also. Uh, my committees are Education, uh, Resource and Conservation, and uh, I chair Local Government. Hello, I'm Tony Gushniewski, representative for District 3. I'm a freshman and newest member. And I serve on the Education Committee, Local Government, and commerce. Hi, thanks for being here again. Uh, Jim Addis, District 4, on uh, Rev and Tax, Transportation, and res uh, Resource and Conservation. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mary Souza. I'm a Senator from District 4, and I sit on the State Affairs Committee, the Health, I'm Vice Chair of Health and Welfare, and I'm on the, the Commerce Committee, which is Business and Insurance. <coughs> Dean Nick, uh, Senator District 2. Last month we were in Senator Susan's district. This month the town hall happens to be in line. Uh, I'm on the uh, Local Government Taxation Committee, the State Affairs Committee, and I'm Assistant Majority Leader in the Senate. Good morning, I'm Paul Ingram, a representative from District 4, which is more or less the city of Coeur d'Alene. Uh, I serve on the Joint Finance and Appropriations Committee, which is the budget committee for the state. Uh, I'm the Vice Chair of Environment, Energy, and Technology. Uh, I also serve on Judiciary and Rules and on the Joint Legislative Oversight Committee, which deals with uh, performance evaluations of other uh, divisions of state government. Thank you. So everybody understands, you know, hopefully you know that we're filling out these question sheets and that makes things a whole lot easier and faster. Quite often we have a number of questions that are all very, very similar. And so one of the things that I do as a moderator is compile them. So your question, exact question may not be asked, but the general idea will be there. And I will add to that if there are additional items that need to be asked. So that's how this works. And if things go completely awry and we don't have any idea what it was about, but we think it's important, we may ask for the writer of the question to stand up and at least try to clarify. Otherwise, it's their show. And starting off the show, uh, Tony, we have a question here regarding you and the woodshed. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Well, let me get this out of the way. I know it's been uh, all over Facebook. It's been on at least uh, four different news medias. Uh, before I get started on the, that particular topic, I'd like to say that I have the greatest respect for teachers. Uh, the person that I am today was largely molded by a lot of the good teachers that I had. And I got to thinking about some of the bad teachers, and you know, I really learned something from them as well, maybe not educationally, but I got to appreciate good teachers even more by having them contrasted with bad teachers. And uh, with our current culture, we have placed so many burdens on our teachers that it's almost to the point of being unbearable. So this is where the concept of social and emotional learning comes in. Um, we need to be grateful for all of our teachers' dedication and service. Uh, 
first of all, I'd like to read a little bit, just a couple of lines out of the press article that started it all. It was the Idaho Education News. Uh, it says, Representative Tony Wisniewski asked the legislators to engage in a thought experiment which he promised would only take 10 seconds. First of all, I never made any promise. Go back a generation more, Wisniewski said, back to when legislators were in school. For many, it was the 1960s when things were different. There was respect then, he said. Parents, Wisniewski said, would take us behind the woodshed if necessary. He then compared the social-emotional recommendations <coughs> to the dystopian 1932 Aldous Huxley novel, Brave New World. <coughs> it's scary to me, and I'm not scared of a lot of things, Wisniewski said. Whatever happened to character development? That is a sum total of four minutes of my testimony at that meeting. Now I'll tell you what I really said. I'm going off the original notes that I made impromptu, so we didn't have a chance to really uh, put it together as well as I would have liked to. But I said I wanted to focus on just one point, and that was improved attitudes about self, others, and school. And I did take us back to the 70s, and I looked at the collective behavior modification system that was represented in the brave new world. And my point there was, Society has changed since a lot of us were in school. My question was, why have we always continued to clean up messes after they have happened retroactively instead of being proactive and nipping these things in the bud? I uh, focused very much on virtues, you know, goodness, honesty, dignity, integrity, responsibility, uh, kindness, charity for all. I've made a comment about the fact that we pride ourselves now we, we virtue signal when we do a random act of kindness. Isn't this our Christian duty to be kind and charitable to all, regardless of whether we get brownie points, regardless of whether we're seen to do this? The best giving is that done in, in secret. I also talked about self-worth and respect for oneself and others. Now, I used the word virtue in that meeting because the word morality doesn't do well in Boise. If you don't realize that, uh, you need to take a trip down to Boise and, and watch some of the hearings. Um, the issue that I had specifically with the social and uh, emotional learning uh, program was the behavior modification that was being introduced as opposed to character development. And I did mention that Bill Bennett, who was the former secretary of the Department of Education, was very strong on educating virtue training, and he actually wrote a book. And I'm glad to say that one of the trustees of the Post Falls uh, School District did get together with me afterwards and said that they do have a strong character development program here in Post Falls, so I applaud the district for that, but I don't know that that happens across the state. So once again, being proactive as opposed to retroactive. Um, after the presentation that I gave, and I'm sorry to hog this up, but this is my only chance to get my side of the story out to the public, I went up and talked to the presenter on the social and emotional learning uh, part from the State Department of Education, and he told me that he agreed with most of what I said. Um, so I told you what I did say, and let me, uh, this morning when I was having breakfast, I ran across this refrigerator bag, I know you can't read it, but it says, it shows this shining young lady who's a mother holding up a tasty tidbit that says, would you like some dessert? So she's talking to her kids. Well, if you read the fine print, it says, would you like to get off your butt and clean the table so that your mom can have some dessert? <laughs> um, what the press reported of my words is 100% correct. It's those words that they left out that really make a difference. So if you don't take something in context, you're going to miss it. Um, I think you've all played the telephone game where you get in a circle, four or five. First person writes down a sentence and you pass.
pass it on from person to person. By the time you get to the last person, I don't care if it's three persons or five. It always gets distorted and it's hilarious. Well, it's hilarious unless you are the object of the joke. Now, if you substitute the second person in that conversation, me being the first one, with the press who has an agenda, and then you put the third person in there as one of your political opponents of a different party, is there any chance that you might get a fair shake at the result after two iterations of that? Every single report that I've seen so far has, a news media report has followed exactly the wording that was used in the Idaho Education News report, which I just read some excerpts from. Now, it's not known also that the chairman publicly admonished the press the next day for the behavior that they had. The writer had a stopwatch and timed when certain people left the meeting room. Now, what does that tell you about his intention? He implied that people just left in a huff. You have to realize that when you're in committee, you have other committee meetings that you have to go and present your bills to, or you have a large group of constituents who can't meet with you at any time exact, except for that specific time. And uh, the chairman of the committee, unfortunately, spoke to an empty house because that particular reporter wasn't there. He was privately admonished the next day when he did show up, as well he should. Uh, perhaps in our English language arts class, we should have a, an exercise for the students to listen to a speech and then look, read what the press has to say about it and see how well it matches. That would be a real good exercise in, in the practice of the lost art of journalism. Now, the reason I chose the uh, Brave New World is because of some of the mottos and beliefs of the Brave New World system. They believed in community, identity, and stability. Community was no family. And let's pull this out of context of education. Let's just look at this as a socio-cultural issue. No family. Everyone belongs to everyone else. Sexual promiscuity is a virtue. Identity. Everyone is genetically engineered in the test tube. There's a caste system where there's workers and intelligentsia and leaders. And then stability is the final part of the motto. Everyone is identical genetically and they're less likely to have conflicts, so this produces less risk in society. The uh, birthing center is called hatcheries and conditioning facility. These uh, humans, if you want to call them that, are psychologically conditioned in their behavior by verbal suggestions in a pseudo-moral education. There's even a center called the Neo-Pavlovian Conditioning Room. And the controller, who is one of the ten leaders of the world, says, history is bunk. Society purposely limits knowledge of the past, which would enable them to contrast it with the present and be able to make improvements uh, so that this lack of knowledge of the past perpetuates stability. There is no change, no possibility of change. There's no understanding of the past. Landmarks are renamed to eliminate conflict. Does this all sound familiar? This was written in 1932, almost 100 years ago. And then lastly, I'd just like to say that B.F. Skinner was one of the mid-20th century pioneers in American education. And his influence in education is still felt today. He developed a theory that he called, quote, radical behaviorism, end quote, which states that all human activity can be seen as behavior and that all behaviors can be modified through reinforcement techniques. And in 1976, he wrote in a prologue to one of his books, and I have to quote this exactly, so forgive me. We know how to solve many educational problems with programmed instruction and good contingency management, saving resources and the time and effort of teachers and students. Small communities are ideal settings for the new kinds of instruction, free from interference by administrators, politicians, organizations, or teachers. In spite of our lip service to freedom, we do very little to further the development of the individual. This is all for the collective. So those are the points that I was trying to make. You know, I 
reference to Brave New World, and obviously I can't go through that on the floor of the house. So I just want you to understand the background, the backdrop behind my statements. Thank you, Governor. There's one more thing I'd like to say. In a very broad sense, it appears that each generation is losing its ability to parent, and we need to make the decision, and it's your decision, not mine. How do we want to do the parenting? Is it through morality or through behavior modification? Thank you.